Hallo und herzlich willkommen bei Kaiser TV International. Mein Name ist Benelin Walter Kirches und ich spreche heute mit Dr. Vandana Shiva. Vandana Shiva ist Physikerin, Autorin, Aktivistin und eine vielfach ausgezeichnete, international geehrte Ikone der Umweltbewegung. Sie ist eine der Hauptorganisatorinnen des Monsanto-Tribunals und hat sich im Verlauf ihres Lebens gegen die neokolonialistischen Praktiken der Agrochemie in Indien, gegen Gentechnik, Biopiraterie und Patente auf Saatgut sowie für kleinteilige Biolandwirtschaft eingesetzt. Ihr Lebenswerk wurde dieses Jahr in dem Dokumentarfilm The Seeds of Vandana geehrt, den wir natürlich von Herzen empfehlen. Heute sprechen wir mit Dr. Vandana Shiva über, über ihr ursprünglich 2008 18 herausgegebenes und dieses Jahr in deutscher Übersetzung im Neue Erde Verlag neu erschienenes Buch Eine Erde für alles, Eins sein versus das Ein Prozent, Aufstehen gegen Monokultur von Wirtschaft und Weltsicht. Die Links zu, zu Buch und Film sind in der Videobeschreibung. Dr. Vandana, it is an extraordinary honor to have you on. Hello. Welcome. So you picked an uh, extraordinarily auspicious day with a Guru Nanak Jayanti today, because he was... Um, the beginner of something of sorts, in this case of Sikhism. And his core mantra was the Ekonka. So, so it begins with one. Yeah. And especially we're talking about your book here, that's now in German, One is versus the One Percent. Yes. And in it, the core idea that you bring forth is that you're making a case for reality versus a series of fictions that are constructed into a machine. Will you outline your analysis of what is happening in the world quickly for us? Well, I'll, I'll first begin with, uh, with my own uh, understanding of the world. Um, I did not accept a mechanistic worldview of the universe, that the world is a machine. I know the world is living, uh, both from my personal experience, as well as my learning and teaching in quantum theory. So in quantum theory, everything is interconnected, non-separability, non-locality. Nothing is fixed, it's potential moving, and it is uncertain. So these are my basic sort of framing principles and ideas. Um, over my long life, <laughs> I have a long life, you know, I'm 50 years I've been a scientist and an activist. Uh, what I'm seeing happen in the world is 1984, Punjab erupted in violence. And that's when I started to look at agriculture and the Green Revolution. Punjab is where I did my MSc honors in particle physics. So that land, I'm very grateful. So, you know, Guru Nanak's land I, for me is a very, very uh, big blessing. And for us, it's been doubly auspicious today, not only because it's the Guru Nanak Dev's uh, Guru pa Purab, But today, the prime minister had to bend to the farmers and repeal Fantastic. three laws of furthering the globalization. 91, okay, so 84 farmers protested against the Green Revolution imposed on us by Rockefeller and the World Bank. It, 91, the World Bank says you're in deep debt, so now we've got to structurally adjust you. And they made all these laws that today, the government was forced to say we will repeal them. Uh, I have watched globalization dismantle agriculture all over the world. And I have seen how this land of prosperous small farmers, hardworking small farmers, created such crisis that 400,000 farmers committed suicide. This deregulation has meant more and more and more wealth has been concentrated in a handful of corporations. You can count 10 in the field of agriculture. Four that control the chemicals and the seeds, four that control the trade, four that turn good food into junk food, the ultra processed food that making everyone sick, the Cokes and the Pepsis and the Nestle's. And now a handful that are emerging in terms of e-commerce, the Walmarts and the uh, Amazons. But behind them are the billionaires and the new investment fund. So, Two things propelled me to write that book, Oneness Versus One Percent. The first was in Paris in 2015, at the climate COP, the billionaires like Gates and Zuckerberg were strutting around on the stage. And I know the UN system is supposed to be a country-led system, a government-led system. COP is conference of parties. These are not members of 
the UN framework on climate change. They're not members of any UN body, but they were dictating what will happen. And we've seen even more of that at this COP26. At, which, has at a, which has Unilever as a partner. But many, all of the big guys. But around that same time, I think it was 2016 uh, or maybe 2017, Bayer bought out Monsanto. And Bayer and Mobe had, um, uh, Monsanto had been together during Hitler's time in a company called Mobe. So I wanted to figure out, you know, how does a company like Bayer buy a company like Monsanto? So we started to look at the investment patterns, et cetera. Between the billionaires and their making money and this buying up, we realized actually the billionaires and their finance in the Black Rocks, which is now $9.5 trillion of an asset management firm, and the vanguards, that they actually have 70% investment in all the big corporations. But the big money is the billionaire money. How did the billionaires become so rich? Because of deregulation. The tech companies have paid no taxes. Mm -hmm. The WTO was basically tax freedom for the tech companies. The WTO, in effect, took our everyday lives that we were leading and made them more and more dependent on the tech companies. So in effect, oneness versus 1% 1 is three things. First, as a colonized country in India, we recognize colonialism when it happens. And I see what's happening as a new colonialism in the old days, they used religion to justify the conquest of other lands and an inferiority, you know, that we weren't fully human, only the European whites and Christians were human. But today the religion is the technology that allows the extraction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a new colonialism. Secondly, we know the world is interconnected. The world is one. Yeah. Ekonkara, as you said. But the 1% that's ruling the world would divide the world up to facilitate the extraction. So it's a divide and rule through constructions, through illusions, and big illusions like the GDP, total construct, you know, just pick a number and then just say women don't work, just say the peasants don't produce, just make the world disappear which is also what's happening now with the carbon reductionism and the entire edifice of the reductionist approach to climate change, a complex phenomena, and it's being turned into the new colonization. It's been named by the negotiators in um, Glasgow as carbon colonialism. And I've written about it, uh, that, you know, you, you, just like you took a number and reduced economics to a number, mm -hmm. now you're taking the complexity of this planet and the disruption of our systems and all the tragedies it's causing, and then reducing it, not just to a number, but to new entitlements mm -hmm. through a cooked up fictitious science and a fictitious accounting system and trading system. And, and the book really was the beginning of that journey if I had to do it today, I'd just add a few more sections in each chapter. The story is just the same fast forward in the same direction that has brought the planet to a brink, created huge inequality between the 1% and the 99%, and is disrupting nature and dividing society. Mm -hmm. And it seems that with uh, the, the coming of the carbon reductionist model, suddenly humans are the problem. So because we are like carbon producing uh, um, useless Machine. eaters yeah, um, <laughs> and useless eaters. I mean, it has a social Darwinist sort of Malthusian uh, uh, feel to it. Yeah. So because we, we are actually polluting with our breath. Basically, they're polluting with our breath, the earth, which how can this be possible even? Yeah, thinking about it, how can my breath be a pollutant? Since when is breath a pollutant? I mean, there's, there, there are other pollutants and, and, and nuclear energy is suddenly green. So we're having like a total inversion like this. I, I, I feel like in the, in the whole environmental movement, um, uh, the, um, the aspect of industrial pollution disappearing more behind You're the so right. Planet. You're so right. So if you were to look at industrialism, it's a very young, distorted process. Mm -hmm. 
fossil fuels and industrialism go hand in hand. And yet there's a blind spot. People think you can have industrialism and yet save the planet. Gandhi rose up against the British Empire on the industrial model. He said, you just have to wait and it'll bring the planet down mm -hmm. because it's such a heavy ecological footprint. The, your reading that, you know, not just humans, but everything living. So we know the stink that comes from factory farms is methane, you know, it's a stinky gas. Mm -hmm. Methane became a problem only with factory farming of animals. Mm -hmm. Animals are now being fed grain when they are herbivores, they should be eating grass. Mm -hmm. Now this, the digestion of the, uh, the herbivores is the four stomachs that allows them to f digest the roughage. That's why mm -hmm. they have four stomachs. They weren't meant to eat beans, soya bean and intensive feed of, of, uh, of corn. That's what is disrupting their digestive system and then creating these huge methane emissions. And you're putting so many thousands into one factory, one prison, I would call it. And all the fake science, you know, Mr. Bill Gates writes a book on climate catastrophe. And he says, the re you know, cows emit methane. Cows have four stomachs. That's why they emit methane. But Mr. Gates, the deer have four stomachs. All the herbivores in the world have four stomachs. And when this planet was full of bison, the prairies of, of, uh, of the US were not stinking of methane. So they're creating false science. And just because they have the money, they can give huge grants to all kinds of scientists who then start criminalizing the cow for having four stomachs. They can start pouring money into criminalizing the sun for shining on the earth and giving us life. So geoengineering is block the sun. The sun is the problem. This methane reductionism as a carbon equivalent is the cows are the problem. Human beings, real human beings living in a living world are a problem. Get rid of them. Get rid of them, both in production, which is why this Russian celebration of artificial intelligence and robotics, we don't need people in any production sphere, mm -hmm. but also we don't need food. Yeah, That's why artificial food is the next big extractive system they are planning. 14 patents on that fake burger called Impossible Burger made from GMO soya with artificial blood added to it. And I mm -hmm. keep saying, why have we got so ontologically confused? Exactly. That we don't know anymore the difference between the real and the artificial. We don't know anymore the difference between meat and plants. We, you know, this mm -hmm. new language of, of ontological confusion is very convenient. But you are so right. We are in a fast forward. If, if I had a very simple reading, I'd say, is the replacement of living systems of the planet and living economies of biodiversity working with biodiversity uh, that are the stable force on the universe. Replacement by fossil fuels is the beginning of the pollution, whether it's plastic pollution or it's toxic pollution with the petrochemicals or it's atmospheric pollution and climate change. The alternative is living systems. The narrative of carbon reductionism and a mechanistic and industrial mindset is basically saying life is to blame and all the false solutions we are bringing to make more money are the solution. So it's another level of illusion creation for another level of colonization. Exactly, to mask uh, a, like a desire that is behind that. What I th uh, think is, uh, well, like what I thought about a lot when I read your book was this entire thing that the case you're making is that the entire system is not real. Now, this, people would say, okay, well, this economic paradigm and, uh, you know, this uh, dog eats dog sort of world <laughs> in which it arose is, is the real and everybody, everything else is naive. It's people trying to think or cook up a, a better world, a more beautiful world or something like that. But uh, you're making a strong case that every aspect of this machine, that is a pyramid, a pyramidic machine of transfer extraction of wealth upwards to the 1%, 
is in fact based on illusion. And I would like to go into the like cognitive aspects of it as well. Uh, in your new book, which I've also looked into, <laughs> From Greed to Care, mm, for example, you bring up a concept I found very, very interesting, the con con uh, concept of um, emptiness or nullius, yeah? Um, you say that um, everything is defined as, as, uh, as empty and then it can be colonized. You write, define the biodiverse, vibrant, creative, gener generative living earth and soil as empty land, terra nullius, or seeds, living resources and bi uh, biodiversity as empty life, bio nullius, or minds as empty minds, mente nullius. And um, this is, I would also add, also uh, health uh, is becoming one of those uh, empty spheres that are now uh, colonized by um, actually what is trying to become mandated medicine. Yeah. So uh, I'm also, again, with Gates as one of the, the core uh, spokespeople for that. Uh, and, you know, I wanted to, to really go, go into this concept of, of the emptiness. Um, can you uh, explain a little bit how you got to this idea and what is behind it? Because what I hear is like sort of this tabula rasa idea that there's nothing that the, the other has nothing in it of itself, but it is uh, empty. And therefore, I can take it or th therefore I can fill it with me. You're so right. That's what it is. Now, how did I come to it? Came to it because those of us who are colonized were defined as terra nullius. Our lands were defined as empty lands by British colonialism, they created a jurisprudence around terra nullius, the empty land. Mm -hmm. Australia, the largest continent with the oldest history of farming, mm -hmm. wise people, they were just defined as not being human. Therefore, it was empty of people. And it was also empty of biodiversity because they didn't have apple trees in Australia. <laughs> really, yeah. yeah. In the jurisprudence, in the, in the legal justification, the emptiness was defined that Aboriginals, Aboriginal people are not fully human and they don't grow apple trees, which is an indicator of a land that's cultivated. Same goes for the colonization of America. They didn't use legal terms there. Um, India, mm -hmm. even though it was such a full land, so terra nullius was a legal jurisprudence of colonization. Mm -hmm. When I started to save seeds, when I realized that the chemical industry wanted to become the biotech industry, wanted to own the seed through patenting, um, I said, oh, what they did with land in terra nullius. They are now basically saying the seed is empty till we put the gene into it. I, I wrote that bio nullius and, you know, when I started to do this work way back in the late 80s, early 90s, interestingly, two years ago, just before the, um, the lockdown, mm -hmm. uh, Monsanto was trying to challenge the law we had shaped in India, where I had worked with our parliament and explained to them, I said, you know, farmers have in, in, in evolved the seed. Farmers are the real breeders. Mm -hmm. And this idea of the seed as a machine, which is empty, till a gene is added, this idea, the mechanistic idea is a very false idea. I worked day in and day out with our parliament. And our parliament then, when we had to change our laws because of WTO, they passed an amendment. We had to pass an amendment, but they qualified the amendment and said plants, animals, and seeds are not human inventions. Therefore, you cannot patent them. This is Article 3J of our patent law. Well, Monsanto has been very troubled by this because their whole ideology was bio -nullius. You know, it's all us. You won't believe it. During their challenge in the Supreme Court of India, they literally said the seed is empty. Till we put, they didn't then use the word genes, they said, till we put the chemicals that make the seed a superman. Now, that's where the lawyers are going, seed a superman. And the mentinalias came to me as digitalization was accelerating, as they were talking about digital agriculture, but what do they do in digital agriculture? They, they put cameras, the field view of a uh, buyer, you know, it basically goes into the farmer's field and takes lots of photographs and extracts this data. Uh, or they watch the farmer operate and take all of that and then put it all into big data and then feed the algorithms back to the farmer who knows how to farm. 
So I said, now they're making us empty minds. And if you look at the new patterns that have been given during this lockdown period, a particular patent of Microsoft, we are users, we are not human beings. We are not living beings. We are users mm -hmm. of their machines. Mm -hmm. And the machines and the algorithms in the machine will judge our value and assign us a value. To all our bodily yes. functions, to all our bodily functions, to our eye movements, to all the other to things. Everything, to, including our existence. And that will then decide who's worth having mm -hmm. and what, who's worth not having, who's worth living and who's not. Because you will, you will work out a dispensability through those algorithms. But, you know, human beings, if, if we think of our time, it's empty land, we are being emptied out of our land. Gates is the biggest farmland owner of America. Our seeds are being, and life forms are being emptied out. The planet is being emptied out of all her life. And that's what the financialization and monetization and 30 by 30, all this language is all about an, uh, an accounting system they've already put in place long before COVID. Mm -hmm. and, and then we ourselves are being turned into empty vessels in terms of the mind, but empty bodies to be invaded into. Exactly. With no immune system. You know, they had uh, last year, they had on uh, mid-November, actually, they had a redefinition of herd immunity, which totally deleted the, uh, the concept of, of natural immunity. They said it was just a concept for, for medical procedure campaigns. And when everybody has had a medical procedure then, or like a certain threshold has been reached, then Uh, uh, herd immunity has been reached. And so like six weeks later, they reintroduced herd immunity as a natural form, but said it is inferior to, um, because it's too costly, you know, this is a, a letting it rip idea. So it's too costly on the, on the, on the overall population. Too many people would die. That's, uh, that's why it is recommended that um, herd immunity is done through a certain pharmaceutical product. And well, we have now the whole continent of Africa, which has uh, next to no medical procedure, and they got to herd immunity just fine. And so the, the idea is, uh, you know, and there was this whole, whole of this uh, basically bullying of Jay Bhattacharya and the, and the group that did the Great Barrington Declaration that came with this traditional epidemiology to actually say we don't have empty immune system or Im immune system is not, not there. Yeah. So it is there and it does something. Yeah. And what's beautiful is, I work with farmers and women farmers and, uh, and you know, they know what plants increase their immunity. Yeah. They just started to plant and share, share knowledge. And when they come to meetings, they so proudly talk of how they built their immunity and nobody in our village fell ill. Nobody got COVID. And, you know, so even though there's this, again, this idea of, you know, empty bodies with no immunity, empty minds with no knowledge, there is an explosion of the regeneration of living knowledge and that we are living systems and the earth is a living system. So um, life is bursting forth. Life is bursting forth through the cracks of the illusions. Mm -hmm. But it's very um, important to really see what the illusion is. And this is something that this crisis and also now the entire thing about the, um, you know, the more and more obvious green mask that, uh, you know, they define digitalization as green. Basically, this is what it is. So, so we are being sold digitalization as, um, yeah, as a solution to the ecological problem. Yeah, this is what I see yeah. at least. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, as a physicist, what I learned was... There's mass and there's energy. Mm -hmm. And in fact, mass and energy are convertible to each other. That the more external energy you use, the more entropy you create, the more pollution you create. So the more energy intensive your system, the more atmospheric pollution you will cause, the more climate change you'll cause. Now, We know in industrial agriculture, you use 10 units of, in, of energy to produce one unit of food, fossil fuel energy at that. Mm -hmm. You do factory farming, you use 100. You will now do more uh, industrial agriculture and more industrial processing of food. You'll probably be using 100,000 units of energy. Mm -hmm. Digitalization, 
every transaction of the Bitcoin is taking more energy than entire countries. Yeah? Mm -hmm. These are heavy, heavy energy intensive systems. The communication is energy intensive. The processing is energy intensive. It is not, you know, they talk the word dematerialization and I've had to debate, you know, in the, in, in the UN, I've had to debate where they said, oh, now that we are digitally mapping the seed, the mm -hmm. seed is getting dematerialized. And say, no, the seed is still the seed. <laughs> the seed is a living organism. You're mapping it with a genomic map is a hugely energy intensive process. And the only use it has, because it doesn't add to the knowledge of the sea, the only use it has is facilitating digital biopiracy. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So um, it, it is definitely, definitely, definitely a moment where the big technology with digitalization, the old big chemical and big agriculture firms and the seed firms that, as well as the big finance like BlackRock, are converging into the final manufacture of illusions, which they're painting green, like they painted the Green Revolution green. It was not green. The Green Revolution <laughs> was very violent and left a trail of death, including the Bhopal disaster. You know, the Bhopal disaster and the Punjab uprisings are what led me to start working on agriculture. Mm -hmm. It was not green, but green has become the favorite mask, as you say, for continuing extractivism, continuing colonialism, and continuing dumbing down the human being. You know, Let's talk about exactly these two um, wonderful um, ideas that you put in here, extractivism, uh, which you also define, reduce living, uh, living renewable, uh, renewable regenerative systems to raw materials. For one way, linear extraction without giving back. Yeah. Can you talk? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, yeah, for a machine metaphor of the world, mm -hmm. the world has to be reduced to raw material extracted from a mine. And then it has to be denied any value, but its role in the living system has to be denied. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in over my 50 years of work, I have done work on forests, I've done work on mining, and in every system, the scientific work I've done, including for Supreme Court, which led to a closure of a mining project, is if you leave the mineral in the mountain, it is performing a bigger economic function, economic as creating systems that produce goods and services and sustain life. Forests left, in the forests, trees left in the forest, have a bigger ecological function. This is why the movement that inspired me called Chipko, where women came out to help the trees, they said these are not timber mines. Mm -hmm. yeah? These are systems that produce soil, water, and pure air. They understood the living system. Uh, so extractivism is one, denying the life of the system where a part has to be extracted, which has value, that part is reduced to raw material, the system is reduced to the emptiness, the terra nullius, the bi, you know, they use the term genetic mining genes in biotechnology, they call uh -huh. it mining genes. In digitalization, they call it mining data. So the mind metaphor of reducing a whole that's living to a part and extracting that part they see it as a mining operation. Mm -hmm. But then any mining operation has huge pollution effects. Well, let's, let's go into the Chipko movement because you made a point there. Also, you meant you're famous for making uh, like a clear case that um, small scale permaculture based uh, um, organic farming outperforms the, any agrochemical uh, chemi chemistry by um, orders of magnitude. It's just, uh, it's not better to feed the world at all. That's, that's settled, yeah, that's settled. Yeah. But, that's but, it. yeah, but now um, still we are not moving in the direction, yeah, we're moving in the direction that the Gates is wanted away from tillage and all of these other things that they think uh, is harming uh, the world. They want to have everything industrialized in these uh, vertical farms and so on inside the cities. 
Um, and um, and this, um, the idea of the what you just said about the Chipko movement, you you like there's an, a concrete effect that the trees have, and why you would say with grounds that it's economically more uh, beneficial to have the tr have the forest instead of the timber. Uh, and uh, and can you can you say uh, tell the li listeners yeah. what this is? Yeah. So in 1970, a forest was cut. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and there was landslides and disasters. Bridges were washed off, roads were washed off. And the women immediately connected the deforestation with the disasters. And that's when the Chipko movement started. Now, if you were to take what's happening in British Columbia right now, there's flooding. What is happening in British Columbia a month ago? There were fires. Why are there fires? Because they're taking rich old growth forests and spring roundup to kill the broadleaf species, which are of no commercial value, because it's an extractive model where they want the timber. Mm -hmm. They want the commercial timber, the conifers. And so they're killing all of the life, but it's the undergrowth and the broadleaf species that create hummus. Yeah, mm -hmm. they, they fall and they create a mulch in the forest. That's where water gets stored. The broadleaf species protects the moisture. They create humidity in the forest. But when you spray Roundup and you have these standing conifer trees, it's a basically a, a inflammable ecosystem now. Mm -hmm. So you get the fires. And because of the fires, the soil is dead. There is no holding capacity. And when this extreme rain comes, there's massive flooding, as we are seeing in the images from Vancouver. Bridges washed off. Vancouver's totally cut off from all of Canada. Rail lines gone, road lines gone. Mm -hmm. You know, animals were being washed away. So leaving the forest, the trees in the mountain and measuring the outflow of stable water systems, that economy, we've done calculations on this, mm -hmm. is a bigger economy. Count the oxygen that those amazing trees give us. Okay. That economy is a very big economy. But most importantly, a stable catchment with the forest creates everything else on which that catchment, which are dependent on that catchment. You add all that up. That is a bigger economy than a tiny bits of profits that a few companies are making by cutting down trees. Now, the illusion is this. You create, cooked up a number called GDP, the gross domestic product. And when you cut a tree, you, the GDP goes up because it's commercial. All that GDP measures is commercial transaction. But the standing tree that protects your life and your rivers is not counted in the economy. So you have illusions that are economic. You have illusions that are the mechanistic paradigm, epistemological, and the illusions about tools and technologies. All of these illusions work in concert. You needed to create a dead earth in order to extract from it. You needed to create more and more violent systems of extraction and call them technology, the technology of the forest of managing our hydrological system is not seen as technology. Yeah? So the blindness of this empty view of bio nullius, terra nullius, mente nullius is nature does nothing. Nature has no capacity. People do not. They have no capacity. Now, what I'm thinking when when you're saying this, I'm thinking about um, uh, the uh, or the Oresteia. So, so this um, Aeschylus uh, um, play, ancient Greek, in which there's um, like a big um, uh, trial in the trial of Orestes, who has killed his mother Clytemnestra, who who in turn has killed her husband because he killed their daughter. So it was just a terrible family. Anyhow, so he was uh, he um, uh, and Athena. She gave um, uh, like a ruling for Orestes because she said uh, the man. Uh, is putting the entire child into the woman. The woman does nothing in this case. She's just an empty vessel uh, that is taking and nourishing the child. And therefore, the father has primacy over the mother. Yeah, it's, it's capitalist patriarchy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's ex it's exactly what I'm thinking about. It's but very, this, I think the, you know, both in this book as well as all my older books like Staying Alive, you know, it's this artificial boundary, that is the illusionary boundary, that just says everything that side is not creative. We define it as not creative. Nature doesn't create. Mm 
Nature does not give us oxygen to breathe. Nature does not give us water to drink. Soils do not give us food to eat. And anyone who works according to nature's laws, mm -hmm. who does not destabilize the system, but provides all the basic needs we need, they too don't create. Only extraction is a creative act, but extraction is a disruptive act for the ecosystem, as well as the social systems, the economies, the indigenous cultures that depend on nature. Mm. So it is basically denying creativity to all of nature and the majority of humanity, and definitely to women. You know, mm -hmm. the women don't, yeah, women are not creative. Women don't produce, women don't even produce children. Forget it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> or, or like if they do, they should stop, you know, <laughs> because climate change. I bet, you know, the <laughs> This I can't do. They can't get it right ever. Yeah, so uh, also now about this, the aspect of dumbing down. So of not um, of making all of these um, ideas invisible, although they are well factually true and scientifically visible. If you want to go and look, uh, what is really happening to the human population? Why are we not thinking about it? And what does it have to do with uh, Rockefellers and the eugenics okay. movement? <laughs> yeah. So the dumbing down is basically that same phenomena of emptiness, mm -hmm. yeah? If we are living beings mm -hmm. in relationship with li other living beings, we have very complex and multiple interactions. Mm -hmm. And that means our body mm -hmm. with all its sensory perception, as well as our mind, functions in a multifunctional way, you know? I call it the biodiversity of the mind, yeah? Mm -hmm. Just like there's biodiversity of the forest, there's biodiversity of the field, there's biodiversity in our gut microbiome, there's a biodiversity of the mind. That biodiversity of the mind is what allows intelligent action, yeah? It, because I'm, I'm looking at the child and saying, oh, the child looks sad or is hungry, you know? Or I look at the tree and say, no, this plant needs watering. That alertness mm -hmm. is intelligence. Dumbing down is related to the mechanistic philosophy and industrialism and now being put on fast forward through digitalization. Peasants are very, very intelligent beings. And when they were, their commons were enclosed and they were forced into factories, they called it dumbing down of their work. Just pushing one lever at one time. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, And the person from you know, Ford said very clearly, you've got to break up the work into little components where no one understands the full process and have the repetitive, repetitive, repetitive work. Mm -hmm. That is dumbing down of industrialism. There's a dumbing down of the me mechanistic mind. And now there's a dumbing down by the digitalization of life, particularly after the COVID where everything's getting digitalized. And I am watching, I mean, I interact with a lot of people. I interact with a lot of agencies. And I am seeing that if I'm sitting with you, I can work things out very, very fast because both of us are interacting in multiple ways. Then it goes into these digital bureaucracies and they have layers and layers and layers and layers and they have no idea what they're doing. They only know how to process data. But data tells you nothing about the system. Mm -hmm. Data tells you nothing about the process. Data is not knowledge. So the reduction of knowledge into data based on the, on the, on the mining of data from us is really turning us into dysfunctional beings mm -hmm. in, in a very serious way. And, you know, they're, they're now recognizing that children who are having being, being forced in digital classrooms, they're not able to perform basic functions anymore, you know, mm -hmm. not able to perform basic functions of life or learning, you know. Because so that is for me the dumbing down. How does it connect to eugenics? Well, you know, eugenics basically is sort of getting rid of large population by design. That is what Hitler's violence was about. Um, and many of the Nazi thinkers who migrated to the United States started to work with Rockefeller. And Rockefeller had a whole program, and this is all historical 
It's in the archives of Rockefeller. And as I've cited in my book, Oneness versus 1%, One Lily Kay, who worked on the archives and did the book called The Molecular Vision of Life, has gone to the roots of genetic determinism. Mm -hmm. And she has shown that long before the DNA was found, long before they knew, you know, what the double helix looks like, they had decided there are atoms of determinism. They didn't know what the atom would look like, but they decided it was an atom. And they evolved an entire discipline of social psychology, which basically started to create programs of education, of health, of selection, basically by saying these people are dumb. And the entire IQ debate, yeah, so not only are, are we as a species getting dumbed down, but this mechanistic idea also creates an hierarchy among human beings and decides who's empty of a mind mm -hmm. and therefore who's dispensable. That's where eugenic fits in. Okay, this is interesting. And then there's this aspect that you also mentioned from Lily Kay's book. Um, where they say that, um, uh, well, they, they actually wanted to adjust humanity to the machine and not the other way around. So, so a lot of this eugenic uh, movement, you can say, is actually dysgenic or creating and maintaining uh, or breeding uh, different castes of people, actually. Yeah, so, exactly, so like, exactly. like an overlord caste and then a, and a, and like a subhuman caste or something yeah. like that. And mm -hmm. then actually um, using these techniques to... Um, to adjust the life that doesn't want that to that, yeah. That's uh, so by force, by and large. I mean, you, you mentioned this entire thing with, uh, with digital learning. Now, um, <laughs> a child is motivated by moving towards someone else. So it means that the, the mother or the father or the teacher or something like that. They they learn for them and to show to them. And so when there is no human being to learn for, why would a child learn? It doesn't, uh, it doesn't, has no motivation because uh, uh, um, motivation is totally relational. Yeah, it, exactly. uh, it's based on a relationship that, uh, that you have with something and uh, based on also relevance that you have in your life, interacting with people, inter interacting with your life. And um, so they are like forcing now everyone, forcing, forcing into this digital thing, forcing the human to adjust to the digital world instead of the other way around. So, so um, this is something that I, I find um, particularly uh, like egregious when I, when I look at the world right now, because I see this all over the place that human beings are expected to, to adjust to, to this, uh, to this machine. Now, if we don't want to do this, and if we see that this is a violence uh, and it's not, you know, it's experienced by people as this is reality. I have to adjust to reality. I have to make a living. But you're making the case that this is not reality. So how do I exit this illusory world that actually wants to deform me into a servant or a cog in the machine? And uh, we as a society and, and, and I as an individual, how do I extract myself out from that? What is the solution? By em embodying yourself and embedding yourself in the real world in a more intimate way. Mm -hmm. You know, living the true relationships with the soil, taking care of the earth, with your food, knowing what's the difference between fake food and the impossible burger and real food, a carrot from your farm, um, knowing what true learning is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And all of that comes from relationships and living. That's why oneness for me is such an important idea. You know, mm -hmm. oneness in contrast to the one percent. Um, so how do we get out of the trap? I mean, illusions are, are occupations of the mind. They are mm -hmm. colonizing of the mind. It's a decolonization of the mind, but it's not a theoretical exercise. It's lived. And through living, you reclaim your being as autonomous in relationship with other beings who themselves are autonomous. Mm -hmm. and in the process, you realize, ah, oh, there is so much more in this real world mm -hmm. than the illusionary, fictitious world. Tells me this world is not empty. Mm -hmm. It's full of love. It's full of compassion. It's full of creativity. And this is the world I inhabit. Now, particularly at this time, where we are not dealing with the old colonialism of 500 years ago, we are dealing with the new colonialism, which is laying its foundations today. It would be so wrong to imagine that it's already fully there. Mm 
Mm. It's there, tiny bits of our life. And for anyone who thinks this is the only reality, just recognize that the same system that says you must adjust to the machine mm-hmm. is then saying, and the machine doesn't need you in the future. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah? Just do coding, just do software, just do digital, but we will have artificial intelligence and robotics and you won't be needed in the future. They say it. They say it so clearly that the only work is digital work, but digital work will be done better by the machine itself. Isn't it better then to find creative work Mm-hmm. That is your true expression and mm-hmm. your true potential and your true care for the world. And that brings us to the three to the three principles that Gardner laid forth to um, to nonviolent resist and build uh, a system that is not like this anymore. And uh, these are Swaraj Sadeshi and Satyagraha. And uh, you know, it, uh, like wrapping up this interview, I would love to to close with these uh, uplifting thoughts and ask yeah. you to speak about them. Yeah, so I mean, when, whenever people think, oh, this is too big, I can't get out of it. I think a lot of people enslave themselves in the mind long before the slavery has actually put the chains around them. So the Monsanto said, oh, all seed will be ours. We will own it all and it will all be genetically modified. And we will write laws that no farmer will have access our seeds and pay us royalty and I just thought in my head but seed is not a machine you don't invent the seed and the principles of Surat Swadeshi and Satyagraha are really what have guided my life so I said what is the Swaraj of the seed that every seed should be allowed to unfold into the future to protect every seed that farmers have a right to save and share seeds yeah share I created community seed banks And out of the living economy, Swadeshi is self-making, Swaraj is self-ruled. All life is self-ruled. The seed is self-ruled and self-organized. The tree is self-ruled and self-organized. Free people are self-governed and self-organized. That is Swaraj, governance over oneself. Swadeshi is making yourself with the local resources. So Gandhi fought the British Empire by pulling out the spinning wheel. And said, we'll make our cloth. We are being enslaved by that empire. We will make our own cloth. So a boycott and a boycott in this case. Buy local and boycott global. Exactly. And finally is Satyagraha, the force of truth, the power of truth. And the power of truth is both the truth of your being, of this earth. The power of truth is your being part of society. And the power of truth is your knowing who you are. That means that every time there's an invasion, every time there's a colonization, every time there's a brutal imposition of injustice and violation, you basically say, I will not be violated. I will not cooperate with your colonialism. That is Satyagraha, called civil disobedience in some other places. It has many names, many things, but Satyagraha is my guiding act. You do not have to cooperate. And don't start making excuses in your mind. Oh, this is too big and this is necessary. Nothing is more necessary in life than life in freedom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is a wonderful last word. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Vandana Shiva, for this wonderful, wonderful, wonderful conversation. Thank you very much. (laughs) 